Hi, this is Kevin Johnson. Welcome to my podcast. If you've come this far, you've undoubtedly heard about the title. You've managed to find a link to this thing, and you're excited to hear about it. I'd encourage you when you get a chance to take a look at episodes online to find episode zero, which will explain a little bit about the title of this podcast versus all of the other options that we had as finalists, a, a real, an episode I'm really proud of. But this first episode covers what for me uh, you know, and for the podcast are two critical conversations. First, we're going to talk a bit about the true meaning of this title with an introduction to life in Nashville from one of my best friends and a terrific songwriter, Rhett McDaniel, who is not only a songwriter, but as you'll find out, like a lot of songwriters in Nashville, has a other job here at Vanderbilt. I want to thank him for taking some time out to, to, to talk with us a little bit and share a little bit of his personal story and life with us. Second, we're going to cover what I think is the most important topic. What the heck is biomedical informatics and why does it matter? We're going to get into a lot of what will actually be topics we cover in a little bit more detail in subsequent podcasts, including things like what is interoperability, what is privacy, why does change management matter, and in what ways can we improve our systems using things like human factors engineering and usability assessments. So we're going to get into a lot of different topics, hopefully in a way that you guys can completely understand and use in conversation after roughly 40 minutes of listening to us talk on and on and on about them. So without further ado, let's go to the bar, talk a little bit of informatics in the round. Well, welcome to Informatics in the Round, a podcast that's really designed to bring informatics to the rest of us. We're sitting here in my pseudo bar while we uh, talk a little bit about informatics today. So my name's Kevin Johnson, and I'm happy to be one of the two token informaticians in the room. And I just want to introduce everybody else. Who are you? I'm Shannon, and um, I used to work at Vanderbilt, and now I'm doing software development for an accounting firm. And you're really, really funny, and you're on Facebook, and and a little bit of Twitter. Love Trump, and what else? <laughs> um, like I said, a little bit of Twitter addict uh, in me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And who are you, sir? I am Adam. I'm a real life biomedical informatician, uh, researcher, and teacher. That's pretty good. And who do we have over there? I am Rhett McDaniel. I work here at Vanderbilt, the university side, not the medical center side. Yeah. Um, and I work in the Center for Teaching. I'm the assistant director for digital media there, and I write songs, which is probably more why I'm here today. It's possible. <laughs> so, so I did ask you to come for that. So, you know, one of the neat things about Nashville is, and that's, you know, as we know why we picked this title, is that there is this whole culture of songwriters in the round. So I don't know how much everybody else knows about, but, but you're obviously an expert. So just kind of help us with what that is. Right. So if you're not from Nashville, you may not be familiar with the format. Um, so there are... It's really, given, seriously, it's just here? It's just here. It's, there may be some other, but most places don't even know what you mean when you say writers in the round. Hmm. And so songwriters in multiple clubs across this town every single night of the week, there are writer rounds. And writer rounds usually start around 7 p.m. and go to about 11 p.m. And they're usually groups of three to four songwriters who get up on a stage and they do round robin. And they just, one plays a song, the next one plays a song, the next one plays a song. And they do that about three times and then they leave the stage and a whole new set get up and do the same thing. And you just have to play songs that you've written, can't do any cover tunes. What's a cover tune? So cover tunes are songs that were recorded by someone else that you didn't write, that you do your version of. And Lower Broadway is full of that, yeah. right? All those honky-tonks down Lower Broadway are playing the top 40 country songs. Um, but write-arounds happen in smaller bars around town, and they're just songwriters singing their own songs because lots of times no one else will ever hear them unless <laughs> they get to play them at a writer's round. So, so how many of these have you done? Uh, hundreds and hundreds over the last, so I've been here 12 years now. Wow. So a lot. 
and and just because it's the obvious question and are you like this big time songwriter who has 20 30 major songs or how does that all work no so <laughs> i'm a struggling songwriter who gets some cuts by independent artists but no major label cuts yet yet, yet. um I've had and lost more than one publishing deal. <laughs> oh, that's, so. Thank you for just putting that right out there. <laughs> so, right now, I have no publishing deal in case anyone hears anything they like. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what, what I remember, when I first came here, I went to the Bluebird Cafe, and they used to have this wall, I, I guess they still do, with all these photographs. And they made a point of saying, anybody who makes it big, their picture comes off the wall. So the wall is designed to basically let songwriters realize you're not alone. There's way more of you who haven't made it big in this town than there are who have. Right. So it was, it was kind of sobering, I mean, in a way, because you, you hear the music in this town from all these you know, songwriters, and you realize that's why people here, when they say they play an instrument, it means they are phenomenal. You don't just come to town and say, hey, I can pick up with a band, because these are not that kind of bands. Right. Fair comment? Fair yes. point? Yeah. I do not tell people I play guitar. Because I'm not, a, I'm a songwriter. And he is lying. Right. But it's the Nashville way. I play guitar like a songwriter, not like a guitar player. So. Right. Anyway. All right. So, so with that, you know, if you've talked about songwriting and writing it around, maybe it's time for you to demonstrate. Yes. So we happen to have a an actual songwriter here, and we, you know, one of the things that also happens in the round is everybody can participate. So once you kind of know the song, you can kind of play harmony. You could theoretically sing along, and that's a part of the whole Nashville tradition. So, Rhett, take us through how this goes. Let's, All right. Why don't you play something? I encourage my two new friends here to <laughs> jump in if they, if, they, if they feel the mood. I was thinking about what to do today, and I've chosen a song that I wrote with my good friend Adam James uh, called Sweet, Soft, Sad, Slow, and Southern. Love Easy this for me song. To say. Um being the uh, inaugural cast, I thought this would be good since we're in the South, right? Yeah. I, and it's kind of about being a musician in Nashville, kind of. So, here I'm, we go. I'm really glad you didn't say, and you know, Kevin is sweet, soft, sad, slow, <laughs> sorry, anything like that, so thank you. That's right, you're not sad. But I am, yeah, right, I mean, thank you. Okay, <laughs> but enough about me. <laughs> go ahead. All right, here we go. I've been riding these rails for what seems like eternity. But I'm not alone, I got friends here beside me. Still, the life of a music man is a heartbreak indeed. The only comfort he can find sometimes is a sweet, sweet melody. So, sing me something sweet, soft, sad, slow, and sudden. Just a little taste of home to lean on There's magic in the music and it keeps me hanging on So sing me something sweet, soft, sad, slow and southern Yeah, 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 yeah Nice Lying here in the dark Wishing I could hold you Heart of mine is a hurricane And there's a storm coming through The world is so loud these days I want to turn down that noise I pick up my phone so I can hear your sweet voice Sing me something sweet, soft, sad, slow and sudden Just a little taste of home to me Magic in the music and it keeps me hanging on. So sing me something sweet, soft, sad, slow and southern. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah. Ooh, ooh. The night has passed. The sun came without warning. Instead of saying good night, we gotta say good morning. I lay down my head as 
as I hang up the phone and Just for a while it felt like I was home You sang me something sweet, soft, sad, slow and southern Just a little taste of home to lean on It's magic in the music and it keeps me hanging on you sang me something sweet, soft, sad, slow, and southern, yeah, yeah. Sweet, soft, sad, slow, and southern. You sang me something sweet, soft, sad, slow, and southern. Oh, that was awesome. That was great. Well, thank you. How fun. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. So, how, so how long have you been doing this again? I've been here 12 years, but I've been doing it for 20. Wow. <laughs> I, just, I just get amazed that songs like that don't get picked up. I really do. Me too. I thought you might say I'm that. I'm shocked. Yeah. So just continuing the, the conversation here. So Adam, what do you do? So I am a professor of biomedical informatics. So what is that? I mean, for these guys, I mean, what, what is that Absolutely. all about? So and there's... please chime in. <laughs> two, two, two words in my title, right? Professor in biomedical informatics. So I'll start with biomedical informatics. First, uh, and so I say that part of my job is to sit around the hospital, uh, figure out what's wrong, and then how we can use uh, computers, information technology, to improve that. So I spend a lot of my time observing uh, what's happening, interviewing people, learning about opportunities to improve quality or safety or efficiency, and then thinking about how we can uh, improve the computer systems we already use or develop new software or, or new tools that would help us do a better job for our patients here, here at the hospital. So you're sitting at a bar, yes. it's really noisy, yep. you're trying to explain what is biomedical informatics. What do, you, what do you tell people? Well, so this is not the official definition for our field, but I would say <laughs> that I try to use computers to make the hospital work better. So you put the word computers in it, so it's all about computers. It's not necessarily about computers. So if you really think about the, the history of the field, it's really about the study of information. So there were informaticians before there were computers, there were people thinking about how to use uh, information about patients, like in our medical records, information about uh, physiology and our bodies and medicines to make better decisions and how to organize that, that information. They were informaticians too. Yeah. So I, when people ask me, I always say yeah. pretty much the same thing. I start out by saying our job is sort of connect the dots between medicine and data to support um, you know, knowledge generation, discovery, decision support. I am sure you guys have no idea what that meant. I mean, is that clear enough? Or? It's, it's clear to me. I mean, before I had worked here, I used to think of that as, you know, the algorithm behind the symptom checkers on the web that show everything being cancer. And I was like, I hope they've got it. Yeah. I hope it's a little bit better at the hospital than it is on those symptom checkers, right? So that's all we do is make these things yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Brett, what about you? I mean, does this make sense? You've, you've been around me a long time. Could you actually say what I did? No. Nobody can say what I do either, but um, so right. So I have trouble distinguishing between like medical informatics and like because people always say bioinformatics. Yeah, yeah. right. That's <gasps> not right. That's, yeah. that's, Hold that's it, the information. Take some blood pressure medicine. Right? Some frustration for right. us. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so right. And so they get kind of used interchangeably a lot. Like people say one when they mean the other a lot. I think. Yeah, I guess. And, and, you know, I've heard people say, if you're going to call me a bioinformatician, it's kind of like calling a surgeon a pediatrician. Okay. Because, because even though they sound close, they're, they're really, really different, right? I mean, how do you describe the yeah. difference? So, I mean, I think at a basic level, a bioinformatician is often someone who's studying things like genetics and genomics and physiologic kind of processes, whereas... Kevin and I are more of medical informaticians or clinical informaticians. And one way I've seen this discussed, though, is that though we, you know, I work on different problems than a bioinformatician, there are some tools and methods like machine learning or like rigorous representation of, you know, knowledge and concepts and thinking carefully about how we name things and identify things and yeah. classify things that we have in common. So we do sit in this kind of overarching field of biomedical informatics, but then there's subfields of bioinformatics, public health informatics, imaging informatics, clinical informatics like, like Kevin and I do. So just to help with the difference between yeah. the two, 
What's one of the biggest things that bioinformatics has given us versus biomedical Ooh. informatics? Ooh. <laughs> Absolutely. So that I think that would help. Yeah. yeah. I'll take a stab at this. Okay. So, okay. so bioinformatics is the group that has helped us to figure out what's in the genes right. that could actually impact disease. So the whole idea that there are what are called Mendelian, which is inheritable, and the non-Mendelian, which is sort of genomic um, diseases, is a part of, bio of bioinformatics. Um, the way I think of it is bioinformatics is biology informatics, right. and biomedical is biomedicine, which, is, which includes biology, just like you said. And then I would say that the big thing that the rest of informatics or, or clinical informatics has pro brought us is the electronic health record. So bioinformaticians have nothing to do with the EHR per se, and clinical informaticians have nothing to do with genetic sequencing per se. Is that a fair way to look at it? I think it's fair, but I think there are places where these worlds collide. So yeah. I spend a lot of my time working on decision support tools. These are programs or alerts that help doctors you know, select the right medicine or make sure they're, they're dosing things appropriately. A lot of that happens in the electronic health record. It's clearly clinical informatics. But increasingly, we're learning that your genes can affect how well a drug might work for you. So a bioinformatician might make a discovery that says, you know, this genetic variant is associated with faster or slower metabolism of medicine, and I could then integrate that into the decision support that I give to the doctor in helping select the, the right drugs. So yep. the, though they're different worlds, they bump into each other a lot. Yes. So Shannon, you worked in IT. I did. So I'm going to test you then. So how would you say all of this is different than IT? Ooh. And the silence begins. And the silence begins. <laughs> Gosh. Um, I, I don't think it is different. I think it is a part of IT. I think, it, you know, if you've ever had a problem with your electronic medical record, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's almost like trying to come back from the dead if the Social Security office tells you you're dead. Yeah. It's really hard to get that scrubbed out of there. Um, I think it's just a very helpful facet of IT. Yeah. I don't... So I wouldn't I, say that. Would you, I know I you wouldn't. wouldn't, and I well, can tell so you were looking well, at Well, I know, really, I know. <laughs> I know. I can, feel, I can feel that my eyes are busily saying to you, you know, Shannon, you blah, 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 blah. But I, yeah. I don't... No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, the way I look at it is this. IT is all about transactions, technology, kind of closed loop, right? So IT is the technology we use to do email when you right. push send, off it goes. Nobody needs to check it. It either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, you get an alert. I think of informatics as open loop. So things where I'm trying to help somebody else do, job, do a job, usually inf using information. And because information is typically in a computer, using a computer. So I think of informatics as trying to help you do a, a search when you don't know the actual right words. So you put in what you think are close words, and then I magically come back and go, you might mean this instead of that. The whole yeah. technology behind synonyms and figuring out which term, if you put it in, will actually make the search you want versus the search you asked for, like all the misspellings and whatnot, that's in the informatics space. And then in the health informatics, that could be things as simple as, you know, Rhett's been to 20 different doctors, I'm trying to figure out his story, and I want to ask the EHR whether Rhett's had any, uh, is on a certain med, right? So realistically, if it's in the med list, you get one answer. And if it's not in the med list, it doesn't show up. That's IT. But if you can p look through the entire record and find everything that kind of looks like it might be a med, and then maybe even query other systems to see to what extent they are providing like a med history, except some are generic med names, some are brand names, and somebody has to bring all that together so that it doesn't look like just gobbledygook, that's informatics. These are the meds you've been on. This is how long you've been on them. This is the dose we think you're taking right now. Even though none of that was sitting there ready to just be read out by the computer, right. that's informatics. Is that close in your mind? I think it's fair. I definitely think it, you know, these are also worlds that, that interact a lot. So you know, I spend a lot of my time concerned with you know, terminology. How do we refer to things? You know, it's easy to say someone has diabetes. Yeah. Exactly what do we mean by that? What complications do they have? Is it type one or type two? You know, do we call it DM, diabetes, diabetes mellitus, type two diabetes mellitus? Uh, at the same time, the tools that I use to represent this knowledge are databases and the programs that we write, uh, you know, that, that yeah. use this knowledge are 
computer programs. And so I think there's a lot of interaction bit between the two fields. The one thing I would add to, to what you said is that I also think that we have a lot of concern in, in the field of informatics with socio-technical issues. So Whoa, we, big word. <laughs> what do I mean by that? So, Good question. Yeah. What do you mean by so that? So <laughs> the interaction between kind of the social world and the, the technical world. And so my favorite example of this has to do with how putting an electronic health record in affects communication between doctors and nurses. Yeah. So uh, typically, when we had paper, uh, a doctor would decide a patient needed a medicine, and they would pull out a paper chart, and they would write the name of the medicine in, and then they would throw it in a bin. And that made a noise, and there was a nurse sitting near there, and there was a unit clerk, and they might say, I just ordered this medicine for Mr. Jones, and here's the reason that I ordered it. And so there was some uh, communication that happened uh, while I wrote out that order. Now, it's a miracle, right? You can go on your iPhone, you can be at a different floor of the hospital, you can type in that order to give the medicine, but there's no actual communication necessarily right. between you and the nurse who's gonna give that medicine. So the nurse may not know that the medicine needs to be given unless the nurse goes and checks the computer and sees the little icon that says there's a new medicine. Uh, the nurse doesn't have a chance to say something like, I talked to the patient, he doesn't want to take that medicine, or his wife said that he had an allergy to that medicine, uh, nor is there a chance for the nurse to hear why you thought to give that, that medicine. Right. And so uh, they're technical solutions, but they have uh, in, in like implications yeah, for more yeah. than just the technology. And so I think we spend a lot of time thinking about how those things play out in the field of, of informatics. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, a, big part of, a big part of what separates the IT part from the informatics part is understanding that interplay between the people and the technology. And so that's why we have people in the department who do nothing but look at workflow or understand change management. You know, how do I get you to go from this to that without basically you bristling up and saying, I quit or I don't want to do this or what everybody says to us all the time in IT, right? So that's a big part of the informatics piece. And Rhett, you obviously live in that world too because in your non-songwriter life, when you're doing educational technologies, I imagine like the introduction of a new educational technology gets just all kinds of rave reviews at places like Vanderbilt. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's, there comes a time, right, there's that tipping point, right, where there are new things that come along and there are, there are those people who are always on the bleeding edge yeah. and will try things out. That's me. You know, and then at some point there's enough of a critical mass right. where things start to change, but it takes a while. Yep. Slow and, and believe it or not, there's, I, there's like a whole science behind that. So that's the really geeky stuff we do, I think. So I so I was thinking about this. So medical records, right? Yeah. So now I'm thinking about privacy issues. Uh huh. And so, like, have I just given up all my information, not knowing to somebody? Like, is all my? Did I, you <laughs> Did you seriously not know? I, like, <laughs> like, who's got like? I you, have it, right? Yes. <laughs> Probably true. I, like, I've been live tweeting. Oh, exactly. Your personal health information. Even while today. We've been sitting here. Um, because, like, where do you get all your data sets? Like, do you. Well, you're now getting into something really big, which okay. we're going to need to cover, in a, frankly, in another but, podcast. But okay. I think the. I mean, what do you. When people ask you that, you know, yeah. what do you say? So, I think that. You've always given medical information to people, right? You talk to the doctor, you talk to the nurse, no. you answer questions, you say, chart. exactly, yeah. And they may write in a paper chart, they may type it in, into the computer. In the paper world, um, we had in some ways fewer protections, right? There was no, not much that stopped someone from wandering down the hallway in the hospital <laughs> and flipping through your medical record and sort of wondering what, mm -hmm. what was going on. But they were limited by physics, you know, they could only walk right. so fast. This, so, this, had, this made a lot of movie plots. <laughs> Feasible. Yes. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, the yes. fake person, you know, the right. writing something into the chart or something. Nurse, please give me this. I'm right. wearing a white coat. Right. Yeah. Therefore, I should have it. Right. Here you go, dude. Right. right. So now that we've made it electronic, uh, you know, we have more protections, right? So I've got to log into the computer. There's an audit trail. If I try to open your record, it's going to warn me that that'll be logged and my boss can see whose records I accessed. Uh, on the flip side, if we don't do a good job of protecting those records, you know, if we don't secure the servers that they're on in our data center, uh, now I can't just steal a handful of records by walking around the hospital. I could steal all of them. Yeah. And so it's really important that we uh, honor the trust patients have, have placed in us by taking appropriate uh, safeguards to, to secure the, those records. And that's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. So that that brings up another, yeah. an, another thing that I think about 
just because in this field you have to be so careful with quality because whereas one doctor can make a mistake on one patient and yeah. have a bad outcome Good point. if your if your systems have a flaw in it you okay. could wreck 200 people just like yeah, it's true i mean as a doctor I mean, when i went into this field one huge. of the things i used to say to people was because i stopped seeing patients right i used to say well i i gave up seeing 30 patients a day for helping 5,000 or more patients a day. Right. So good trade-off. But you're right. I mean, But you can you, also hurt 5,000 people a day if you're if if you don't execute that. Right. Well. right. Because yeah. Amazon's right. never right about what they think I'll like. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> like other people like this thing. I'm like, oh my doctor's Well, we not all know that you're not like algorithm. other we all know you're not right. like other people. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I hate these other things. Yeah. So, the, so the privacy thing's a big deal. I, I mean, I have to confess, what I always say to people is, you gave up your privacy a long time ago. You did. Right. I mean, mo- many people would say post 911, but I would certainly say, from a healthcare perspective, your insurer has had all this information. Right. The only people, and Deborah Peel, who's like one of these major privacy people in the world, runs a thing called pri- Patient Privacy Rights Network, has always said, everyone has access to your information except you. Which is actually true. Yeah. This is true. So, so one of the one of the challenges in informatics is probably an education one, not a fixing that problem one. Right. Because we do everything we can do to preserve privacy, but then I, you know, I have to come back and say you're on Facebook, and I could probably find out a lot about you by just looking at your Facebook. Let's go look at that. Right. Let's go find right. your. Right. So how do you how do you reconcile the idea that you're willing to put it out on Facebook? But you may not necessarily want us to put it out to do research or to do other things with it. Right. I think it's just informed consent. Yeah. And I don't know that I've always been informed. Well, you have it with Facebook. Right. Right? I mean, you can't trust Facebook with your data. Right. Yep. Right? Um, So last year... I guess I won't be posting this on Facebook (laughs) now. (laughs) I don't... I I, I really... um, I'm with you. I think we gave up our privacy a long time ago about a lot of things. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it, it's been really interesting because last year I sent off my DNA sample to Ancestry.com. Oh, wow. And I did 23andMe like a month later. I find that fascinating. I've had more people tell me, I can't believe you gave them your DNA. I'm like, that's already out. I mean, that is yeah, out right. there. Well, so I've your learned DNA. I've so much about myself. So here's how that works, because this is one of the interesting things about privacy, right? Your data may be out there, but it's not really attached to you. So even if all it is is your name, it's still not even attached to you. We need a little bit more information to conclusively identify that you are the Shannon who that relates to. And Ancestry is one of the places where that happens, right? So it turns out that if you put your DNA in a database where your name is attached, and that also allows you to put in other data, which is why Ancestry works, so that we can find your siblings who are long lost or who your real dad is or you know, whatever scary thing they do. So now you have this other database that's public, and people can look at the two of them, and one of them they definitely know who you are, and the other one they might know that there's a, there's a female, right. and they might even be able to tell your race because of your DNA. It's when you combine those two that now we know who it is. So, in fact... If you're super, super worried about privacy, what you want to do is leave as few extra like variables about yourself out. I'm sorry, as many variables out, out as you possibly can. can when you start saying exactly who you are. So I think why people feel safe on Facebook is what is there to, you know, what is there that you're giving to people that you think could cause you problems as long as you're not posting, you know, fourth night drunk. Hope I don't get a right. DUI while driving. <laughs> that would be stupid. Well, we have those people. <laughs> <laughs> well, and for me, it's not even as much as it's not um, as much about what they could do with it, other than it's valuable. Yeah. And I should be compensated somehow for it. Then, like oh. my data. This is what starving songwriters say. Right. Is my data is worth? If you're going to sure. take my data and make money from it, then I need a cut of that. <laughs> and yeah. So, so we need to, we'll dig into this some more, and I actually might bring you back here to talk about this some, if you're willing, because it is a, it is a different and very big issue, but it's a fair thing to say that we in informatics think about privacy. We have experts down the hall who think about it. Um, you know, we do what we can do, 
but as, as we're hitting at, you also have to do what you can do so that the things that we are trying to protect, you don't make it easier for people to identify them. Like one of the things I heard from some friends is, it's okay to put your data in a large public database, but just don't tell people you've done it. Because it's easier to track down you if I know you're in there than if I don't know for sure. Because now I can start asking the data, I can start asking the data questions. And you can imagine, if you were playing like 20 questions and you knew everybody in the room, it'll be much right. easier for you to figure out who that person is without them ever telling you anything. Because you can ask all the other questions that make this the only one who's left. Right. And those are the kinds of tricks that people play in this whole space that, that we as informatics can kind of help with. Like one of the ways we can do it is to say, we think that if you get within 10 of me when you start asking questions, that all I'm going to tell you is, yep, you're still within 10. Yep, you're still within 10. And you'll never know you got just one. So that's a way to kind of do it. But, but I do love my online medical records. I'm glad you do. I love them. You're welcome. So, <laughs> well, I, I do too yeah. until I see something that's inaccurate. And then that makes me insane. Uh, yeah. So, so sticking with the topic then. Okay, so, <laughs> so what do you think informatics has to do with you seeing something that's inaccurate? Like, what are we doing wrong? Oh well, it's not. It's not the informatics piece that. If, if, for example, I had my smoking status was incorrect on my medical record for a very long time. Like it took forever to get yeah. that undone. So what did it, what did they have you as? They had me as I smoked. I smoked cigars. I smoked pipes. I mean, like Pot. every single well, <laughs> crack, that too, crack, of crack. course. <laughs> but it, you know, it, just it checked it all of the above. It, it, it did. It said I smoked everything, and I used to uh, chewing tobacco, and da 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 da, and it literally made me nuts every time I saw it, and I would and I would tell the doctor that is not correct and it it just made me nuts so, the, so to make it right because i needed it to align right with who i was i just started smoking everything there you go i got a high five on that one good plan good plan i guess it's telling me something yeah right that explains a lot so actually though that that is an informatics problem because we study usability and if the registrars or the other people who are using a system are able to make a mistake and the doctors or the nurses who are, or you who know the right answer aren't able to fix it, then we have to ask ourselves a question about why might that be, why was that hard, how do we make that easy? The, t the solution will be an IT solution, but the question is very much an informatics question. Yeah. I think one of the challenges of, of our EHRs is that they make it really easy to carry information forward. Yes. And if it's inaccurate. Exactly. It's incredibly time-saving. But once something false gets in your chart, it just keeps getting perpetuated. So I have a prescription right now that keeps showing up through yep. SureScripts that I've never taken. I've yep. never been prescribed or whatever. Right. And I can get it removed. Yep. And then zip, it comes back. back. It's yeah. the, like, same thing. Yeah, really? my medication. I have all my medications I've ever taken in my life, and I keep taking them yeah. off, and they keep coming back on. Really? No, but, yeah. You need to <laughs> fix this. You need to fix this. <laughs> we know the solution to this problem. It's been hard to implement. Yeah, and it's actually a hard problem, and it is an informatics problem. Yeah. And this has to do with interoperable systems, which is right. probably words you have no idea. How do you describe interoperability? So I think that it's easy to imagine that you have one medical record, that there's your medical record. But in fact, Vanderbilt keeps a medical record about you if you've been seen in, in the hospital down the road. They have a separate one. And for a long time, those records were totally separate. And the right. only way that you could bring them together was asking the hospital to fax us the record, or you would bring a copy of it to us. Um, there have been efforts uh, over the last several decades, although they're really kind of picking up steam now, to create some technological interconnections between those systems so that uh, we can see some of the data that they put in the, re in the record about you and you know, they can see data that we put in. One thing that's always surprised me is that I think patients often assume that that was already happening. Yeah. That when you pulled up a medical record, I saw everything that had been done to you, right. you know, for your whole life. In fact, I really just thought what was done to you here at this yeah. hospital. Right. And so 
Um, this is a really good system, as you can imagine, it requires some, some magic, right? We've got to figure out that, you know, your record down the street is the same as the one here. Is and, it the same you? Yeah, is it the same right. you? We look at your birth date, we look at your uh, name, but maybe you had your maiden name somewhere else or a nickname or something like that. And, and that's so, why that we yeah. always ask for, like, mother's maiden name. Exactly. Because we look for some information that won't change. Yeah. Because yeah. cause your name will change. And people lie about their their date birth, their date of birth all the time <laughs> yeah. and certain patients use other people's insurance cards so right. they don't have to pay so there's all of these pieces of information that when we get the sort of big three um, which is your gender your date of birth your mother's maiden name we can often figure out exactly who you really are and that's how we do a lot of this is, um, that, why sure. it, is that why you do it because people lie about their age well we do it because no one piece of that information is terribly accurate all okay. the time how about that? That was totally politically think, correct, wasn't it? And I, I, and I don't need that. What? To totally. lie about your age? No, I don't need you to be politically correct. I, I know that. You yes. Know that. He's um, on a podcast. But he, he, <laughs> he, lies about, he lies about his age. Kevin does. I don't. I don't. Uh, well, what I do you is... You told me you were older than me, and there's no way. Well, here, so here's what I do. When my birthday hits, I start calling myself the next year. And I don't even know why I started doing it. So... My birthday was October 23rd. I'm born in 1961. I think that makes me 58 right now. But I, isn't that right? Yeah, it does. That's right. 8, 1, 9. Do you believe he's 58? 50, I don't believe he's 58. I'm 58, but I say I'm 59 just because it's done. And then when I can get used to that. So in a year, when I start saying I'm 60, right, I can You're actually celebrate. die a whole year early. Yeah. It's possible. <laughs> I know. Actually, it'll surprise everybody because they'll think I died at one age and I'll be off by one. I'll be like, <gasps> He was so much younger than I thought. <laughs> right. But no, um, that's the, what we do. I mean, there are people who lie about their age. There are people who, who say things, for example, like 5th of October, and then people write 5 slash 10, as opposed to October 5th, yeah, right. when they write 10 slash 5. Right. And we just, you know, you would never pick up on these things. Um, and like you said, I think the, the real informatics challenge is helping like all the people who are in the healthcare system to know that there is an outlier. Like every other system, your birthday was this. Or my other favorite, it turns out that if you look at a typical electronic health record, one out of every 30 or so records is a duplicate. Um, because most of the time when you're coming in the hospital and you're, you're like going to the emergency department or going to a new clinic, if you don't tell them your middle initial or if you misspell your last name, it's they'll type it in It'll, they won't get a hit, and they look at this long line of people, and they go, well, "I'll just add." You know, I got to get, I got to keep you going. Yeah. And then you wonder why, when you come back, they have no meds on your list, and it's because you're the completely the wrong patient. Then they have to go back through medical records and do an automatic join of those two records to combine the labs they did under your wrong medical record number with the rest of your history, and that's another big informatics challenge. How do we do that? effectively because your record will not be split into two places. So I would I would imagine another challenge would be is if you merge two records together that shouldn't be. Happens. Yes. I would think that once new data came into the new merged record you've got a mess. Yes. yes. In fact for a long time our strategy here was we never really merged those records and that allowed us to say because if we say Adam Wright and Adam J. Wright are the same person and then Adam J. Wright comes in and gets tests, but you come in and see the tests and go, those aren't my tests. Like, that's the wrong blood type. Right. Happens a lot. Happens some. Yep. Less in the electronic era than you'd think. It It happened way more, by the way, with paper. 30% of the time there was like wrong stuff in your chart. Um, but, yeah, that's the whole reason why we can make systems that essentially say, I have 10 examples of you being A positive and one example of you being AB positive. My guess is that one's wrong. And that's what we did here with our old system. So. Yeah. Anyway. So I have another question. Yeah. So everything we've been talking about has been like patient focused. Right. So that's different than like CDC kind of information, right? Like, right. you know, you hear, ah, oh, syphilis is on the rise in Nashville. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Why did you go right Why? there? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Right, you hear yes, that. Yes, like, we do on the hear radio, that like, syphilis is on the rise. Not that any of us have this problem. That's right. <laughs> um, so is that is that biomedical informatics? 
Yes, I would say okay. so. So uh, there are a few sub areas of biomed what I would call biomedical informatics, one of which is public health informatics. Okay. And so that's people who work at a state health department or a county health department or at the CDC. And they do things just like you said, you know, they track the spread of diseases using epidemiology. And in some cases, the source of that is data they collect for themselves. You know, they go out and you know, drive around and interview patients and okay. collect data. In other cases, they actually work with doctors or work with, with patients. The, the syphilis example, there's actually a law that says that if we do a syphilis test here at Vanderbilt and it's positive, we have to notify the county health department okay. uh, and then they notify the state health department, they notify the CDC. And that the point of that is not to make a list of everyone about syphilis, but to sort of count the number of syphilis cases, right. look for clusters and uh, study how these things are spread. I and mean, as you can imagine, there's a lot of informatics challenges, right? You know, how do we define a diagnosis of syphilis? How certain do we have to be? What do we call it? You know, do we use a number to represent syphilis? Do we use the word syphilis? Do we use the causative organism? I'm so glad so, I chose that as an example. Yeah, it's a great example. I, so, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> I tried to help you. Exactly. <laughs> Can't wait to see the transcript. <laughs> Yeah, that is definitely, in my opinion, is definitely informatics. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, there's no right. question. So, I mean, the point of that is when you, when they say it's on the rise, the question is how do you know that? And, right. yeah. and, and so that means there had to be data that were collected. Those data had to be, um, another fancy informatics word, harmonized, which means if three or four different clinics call things different names, like one way to call syphilis is to call it syphilis. Another is to say that you had a positive RPR. Another way to say that is that you... Um, tested positive with the abbreviation for it. People want to try to be, quote, sensitive. I'm using air quotes. Right. Um, and because syphilis is a stigmatizing disease, they may not want to actually use that term okay. in certain places. And then you have to somehow get all this information to one place okay. and figure out that there's a picture that we need to let people know. The worst part is the other thing that the state has to do, theoretically, is do field work to track down and eradicate the root cause of your syphilis. There is this whole group of people who work for the CDC and for the states, and their job is to ask you the next round of questions when you have a positive syphilis test, which is, who have you had sex with? Right. Because then they have to find out whether those people also are known to have syphilis, and if not, they have to try to get them in to test them. Syphilis is actually a really weird disease. It's, it's um, as the lone doctor here, it's the big, it's the great imitator, has been called that since the days of Osler. It's got so many symptoms because it's got three different phases of the disease that if you have tertiary syphilis, which is like the furthest out, it doesn't look like you have a sexually transmitted disease at all. It looks like you have a totally different, weird, systematic, neurologic, and arthritic disease. Gosh, that sounds like somebody we know. I <laughs> hope not. <laughs> who are you? No, don't tell me. I don't want to know who you're talking about. <laughs> But let's just go with, oh, no, that's awful. <laughs> but no, so there's a whole, there's that whole part. Right. How do you diagnose it? That's an informatics problem. There's tools like um, what was called QMR or ILLiad or DXplain or a couple others that are out there. That's the whole job is I can type in symptoms and possibly get back a diagnosis. By the way, Google works incredibly well now, too. If you put in symptoms, you will likely find that there's a paper that shows up that has the word syphilis in it. <laughs> um, or something else, a PowerPoint presentation, or who yeah. knows what. Um, and then there's all the other parts of this which have to do with how do I actually track down this whole network of people who have it in case there's one common vector. So, I probably just used a fancy word, but since you're not calling me on it, I'm going to go with I, it. I think you should keep it. Okay, there you go. So, do you guys, so if, if we were to like leave and ask you to talk about what biomedical informatics is, are you closer? I'm closer. Sure. <laughs> so you think you could write a I like song my about medical us? record. You think you could write a song about us now? Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> would it be fun or would it be really boring? Oh, it would be sad. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> I've seen my medical record. You know what? You should. I should challenge. I should challenge you just for the fun of it to put something together and come back and play it. Hmm. We about, about a medical record. I about whatever that's... informatics topic you want. I promise you a spot back in that very okay. comfortable if chair. I, if I come with something worthy. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Well, thanks everybody for doing this. I, this has Thank been you. a lot of fun. Um, I really do hope that we've kind of explained it in a way that that everybody who's listening to this could kind of go home and say, okay, I think I'm getting a sense of what biomedical informatics is all about and 
you know, you've actually brought up some great other topics that we'll have to make sure we cover, like the issue of privacy and interoperability, Come some of these terms that, as you said, I don't think most people really have a clue about what those things mean. And there's a bunch of others that when I listen to the transcript, I'm sure I'll make a list of and we'll talk about them this year. So thanks, everybody. It was great meeting you. Thank thanks. you. Have a man. Great. Okay, we're done. That was fun. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, look how great of a view you have. I do. I love it. It's really funny when there's bad weather coming in. Um, everybody pours in this office. <laughs>